it's Rob Port. Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. Later in the show, Congressman Kelly Armstrong joins me, taking your questions. He's on every week. We had a, about a half dozen or so questions this week uh, pertaining to, well, baseball, the national debt, uh, food stamps. It's a pretty interesting interview. Stay tuned for that. But before we get there, I want to tell you a little story about how an offer of ballet tickets set off an emailed war of words over what is one of the most controversial uh, policy proposals, uh, both of the 2018 election cycle and the 2019 legislative session. Now, just to catch you up, if you haven't been following along, Measure 1, approved by the voters last year on the statewide ballot, was a constitutional amendment which created an ethics commission, uh, created some new reporting requirements for the legislature, and put all sorts of restrictions on political activity, such as giving gifts to lawmakers and things like that. Now, at first blush, I'm sure that a lot of you probably think, well, that's a good thing, right? We don't want lawmakers influenced unduly by goods, and we want ethical government, and this is all very good things. But a number of people, myself, uh, the ACLU, other free speech groups, have noted that the language in this bill is so broad that political activities, I think most of us would agree, are perfectly acceptable and perfectly in bounds and not unethical at all would in fact become illegal now what's happened is is the legislature has come to its crossover break that's the break at which uh, the senate sends the house all the bills that they passed and vice versa and then each chamber takes up the other chamber's bills uh, we've now come into the break but as we went into the break uh, there was a little bit of an email exchange that was provided to me by a legislative source uh, among uh, one of the activists behind Measure 1, uh, a couple of, uh, well, three state senators, and the head of a Bismarck-based nonprofit. Now, it all started when Hollis McIntosh Hyde, uh, who is the director of Northern Plains Dance, they're a nonprofit based in Bismarck, uh, she emailed a number of lawmakers, including State Senator Howard Anderson, he's a Republican from Turtle Lake, offering two free tickets to see a performance of a production called Dance Plus. Thank you for your support, and we can't wait to share this extraordinary performance with you, Hyde concluded in her email. Now, at this point, Senator Anderson responds to the email. He's, he and basically declines the ticket. He wrote, Thank you for the invitation to attend one of your Northern Plains dancer performances. However, pursuant to the recently adopted Article 14 of the North Dakota Constitution, we can no longer accept gifts, and I must decline the complimentary tickets. Now, at this point, Ellen Chafee, and I'm not sure how she got in on the email thread. And by the way, if you want to read all of these emails, I have them up at sayanythingblog.com. You can read the full email chain for yourself. Anyway, Ellen Chafee, who is a left-wing activist, uh, she's a Democratic uh, Party operative. She uh, she actually was the lieutenant governor uh, candidate in 2012 uh, when Ryan Taylor, Democrat Ryan Taylor, for, former uh, Democratic lawmaker Ryan Taylor, ran for governor against then-Republican Governor Jack Dalrymple. Uh, she was his lieutenant governor candidate. Uh, she's been very active in North Dakota politics for a long time, obviously on, on the left side of things. Uh, she describes herself as vice president of the North Dakotans for Public Integrity. That is the uh, ballot measure committee, the front group that was formed for the coalition of Hollywood activists and other left-wing interests that, that funneled money into North Dakota to buy this ballot measure onto the ballot and paid for the marketing campaign around it to convince North Dakotans to, to pass this thing. Uh, she jumps in on the email thread. Now, I'm not sure how she got in on it. It's it's not clear from the emails. Maybe somebody forwarded it to her. I, I don't know. But she jumps in and, and she says that, that she has to set the record straight because Senator Anderson got it all wrong. And uh, and these tickets aren't, you know, accepting these tickets wouldn't be illegal. She writes, I quote, the gift prohibition in Article 14 does not take effect until January 5th, 2021. Nothing has changed and nothing will change in this regard until then. Even after that, it is entirely possible that this kind of situation situation will be perfectly fine. The new ethics commission and the legislature are responsible for deciding such matters. Now, she's being a little bit facetious here, and Senator Anderson, in his follow-up to the email, points that out. He writes, I quote, If something is to be unethical in two years, then it is as just as unethical now. Also, since the two years is up on January 5th, 2021, the legislature will not be back before that and must get any guidelines in place in this session. Everyone wants to comply with the intent of Article 14 even now to get ready for January 5th, 2021. Now, he goes on in his email to note that Senate Bill 2148, 
That's the legislation implementing Measure 1, right? So the, the, the voters passed Measure 1 and put it in the state constitution. Now the legislature has to pass bills uh, implementing the measure. Uh, one is Senate Bill 2148, which was introduced by State Senator Tim Mather of Fargo, who is also one of the sponsoring on the sponsoring committee for Measure 1. Uh, he goes on to note that Senate Bill 2148, which did pass the Senate and now awaits, since we're heading into crossover, awaits a vote in the House, uh, defines a gift as, quote, any item, service, or thing of value not given in exchange for fair market consideration. Further, it defines a lobbyist as, quote, a person who directly or indirectly attempts to influence the government. Anderson continues in his email, the nonprofit Ms. Hyde represents might just be trying to be nice to legislators. She also might be trying to show us the importance of the art of dance and perhaps influence legislation to make grants available for such worthwhile activities at a penalty of $5,000 per ticket. No legislator will want to take the risk. Um, and, and this, I, I think, really illustrates perfectly the problem with Measure 1. Now, again, it was sold to, to the public as being an ethics measure. And, I mean, taken at face value, who the heck is against ethics? The problem, though, is that ethics, I don't want to say it could be situational, but you can write language supposedly to enforce ethics and, you know, we're going to ban gifts from lobbyists, but you define gifts and you define lobbyists in such broad ways that something like this, which is just a non-profit trying to give lawmakers uh, a chance to appreciate what it is the non-profit does, which, again, I don't think is unreasonable and I don't think it's unethical, but it creates a situation where this could be illegal up to the point where lawmakers accepting these tickets could be guilty of a $5,000 fine per gift, per ticket. Maybe te- a $10,000 infraction for having accepted these tickets. Now, that's unfortunate. And again, let's think about this for a moment. Measure 1 defines lobbyists in such a broad way that it includes anybody trying to influence the government. Well, everybody tries to influence the government. When somebody writes a Facebook post complaining about an issue, you could say that that's an exercise of free speech intended to influence the government. If you write your lawmaker a letter, obviously you're trying to influence their opinion one way or the other. Therefore, you're lobbying. That's how Measure 1 has defined it. Now, you could argue that maybe um, maybe Senator Anderson, and by the way, later in the email chain, uh, Senator Mathern, who's a sponsor and, and a supporter of 2148 and the ethics measure, as well as Senator Jessica Unruh, a Republican from Beulah, uh, who is a critic of it. They join in as well. But you could argue that Senator Anderson is being facetious here, that he's purposely uh, interpreting Measure 1 in an overly broad way uh, in order to make his point against the measure. And I would respond to that by saying that Measure 1 was written in an overly broad way. It was written in a way that is going to end up sweeping up a lot of, again, what what most of us probably feel is perfectly acceptable political activity is going to sweep it up and make it illegal. It's going to chill political speech. It's going to chill participation in our government. Now, I would argue that some of the people behind Measure 1, that this was their intent. You look at groups like End Citizens United, which was a big funder of this you look at groups like represent.us i don't perceive these as groups that want more participation in politics these are groups that want less participation in politics particularly participation in a state like north dakota that leans overwhelmingly republican giving the leftward ideological inclinations of those two groups so we're left with a situation where Measure 1 has overly broad language and its supporters are telling us, well, you know, it, it doesn't have to be overly broad. The legislature and the ethics committee can uh, can choose to to narrow it down. I mean, they're going to be in charge of, of implementing it. But again, my response is, why do we want such overly broad language to begin with? Why do we want to have to rely on the forbearance of elected officials and political appointees to ensure that our rights are protected, to ensure that this law isn't implemented in some draconian way that infringes upon our ability to participate in politics and exercise our free speech rights. That's been the problem with Measure 1 all along. Opposition to Measure 1, despite claims from its supporters to the contrary, has never been about wanting to promote unethical behavior or wanting to protect, you know, unethical 
uh, arrangements between lawmakers and lobbyists or anything like that. It's always been about avoiding the creation of this bureaucratic nightmare where people are afraid to engage with their lawmakers, to invite them to events to in, in, in ways that, that, again, I think most of us would agree are perfectly reasonable. That's always been the problem with Measure 1. Anyway, if you want to read these emails, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating case in point for this, what's been a very complicated debate about Measure 1. I have everything up at sayanythingblog.com. Go check it out. Uh, my interview with Congressman Kelly Armstrong, next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota, Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Congressman Kelly Armstrong joins me now, as he does every week, to take your listener questions. If you have questions that you want to submit, you can do so. Obviously, these aren't live, but you can submit them ahead of time, really anytime you want. If it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you got a burning question on your mind, email it to rob at sayanythingblog.com. Also, the day of, I put up a Facebook thread, uh, also a Twitter thread. So if you're if you're following me on there, you can uh, go there and, and submit your questions that way. Congressman, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Pretty good. So you were up actually in my neck of the woods not so long ago. Uh, you toured the Minot Air Force Base. What, what are you doing? What would you see? What'd yeah, you we, well, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a unique base, not only in the United States, but in the whole world, in that it's the only military base in, in the entire world that has two legs of the triad at the same spot. So uh, obviously, we all come from different backgrounds, and I haven't had a ton of military policy at any stage, whether it was civilian or in the state legislature. So it was important for me to get up there, meet with the commanders and find out what they're, what they're doing well, what they need help with and where we go, where we continue to move forward. What do they need help with? Uh, modernizing, you know, uh, B, our B-52s are, I mean, they told us the oldest one is in 1960 and the newest one is in 1961. And it's not actually the planes they want new. These things, they want to fly them for another 40 years. But flying them is only part of the, obviously part of the mission. They have to be able to engage um, in 21st century combat operations. So modernizing old planes has, uh, and the payload on those things is amazing, but modernizing old planes has a particular set of challenges. So making sure that we're aware of that and how that fits into the national security um, and into the budgets and into those and, and into that process. I know you were with Senator Kramer, and I was actually at an event with him last night. And one thing that I heard him say, I mean, if if we push these these B-52s at the Minot Air Force Base out another 40 years, we're talking about a 100-year-old platform. Absolutely. But uh, I mean, I think it's, it might be the best example of they don't build them like they used to. Um, yeah. they, they, uh, the airmen take tremendous pride in that airplane and dealing with it. Uh, and and it is an absolute workhorse and finding out how often it is it is they're they're constantly requested by all different branches of the military and all different theaters and the reason is is they're so effective at what they do so um but it's just making sure they're still technical i mean whether it's targeting systems or engines or radar to make sure that we are continuing to keep them in 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 the shape they need to be in for 21st century warfare. Now, this week you announced your support for food stamp reforms. Tell, what are you supporting? Yeah, this is actually a really small section of food stamp reform that could have a big impact. I think some the projection is it could save $15 billion over the next 10 years. And it's dealing only with those members of uh, who are receiving food stamps that are able-bodied without dependents. And it's primarily dealing with how states grant waivers, because typically you're only supposed to be able to be on food stamps for three months in any 36 month period, unless you are working or have completed 80 hours of work training in a month. Um, but oftentimes the arguments we heard, and I've been on the, I, I've, I've argued on the other side of this issue in some cases, is we want to make sure that when there is a welfare services or these types of services going to families and kids, we aren't penalizing the people 
who need this the most to survive. But this is a really small subsect in that they are able-bodied without dependents. So I think it's good reform. I think we can do it without congressional uh, approval. And I think it's something that shouldn't be controversial as the entire food stamp conversation tends to be controversial, particularly when it's paired inside the farm bill. Just so I understand the reform at hand here, it, this this is the way states waive or, or, or control waivers because there's federal guidelines for like how long you can be on food stamps and, and some of those conditions. And a lot of the states just issue waivers uh, allowing setting those guidelines aside. So, so what exactly would the reform do? Yeah, it would it would more tightly enforce the way states are able to grant waivers. And I think there's a good time to do it is right now is when we're at national unemployment at four percent. Right. Um, the waivers are granted. And we'll use that as an example. It doesn't matter if the national um, unemployment rate is four percent. If you live in a particular com- community where it's at 17 percent, you should still probably get a waiver. Um, so it still has those built w- would still have those built in safeguards in place, but it would tighten up. Uh, the uh, the fed, uh, the federal allowance of state waivers. So you can't just keep waiving, keep waiving, keep waiving. You have to have certain criteria met before the waiver will be granted. I want to I want to segue from that into a question uh, that came in via Twitter from Clark. He asks uh, quarterly because obviously what you're talking about is savings on food stamps, fifteen billion dollars over ten years. Clark asks quarterly deficit increased 43% over last year. Thoughts on the tax cuts not paying for themselves. Is there any momentum in the GOP to address the $22 trillion debt? I hope so, because we need to continue to talk about it. Um, I think one of the problems we will run into, and and by the way, I mean, in a, we weren't good at it when we were in control. So being <laughs> having an ability to do it when we have a divided Congress and you know, PAYGO has been taking out of our budgeting process on the Democratic side is going to be interesting as well. But um, it's there's always something going on that's top lining, but our national debt needs to be considered to be talked about and we need to figure out a way to get it under control. Uh, Clark seems to be asking, uh, he, he seems to be suggesting here that the tax cuts have, are contributing to this problem. Do you agree with that? Um, I I. I, I don't particularly agree with that. I think the tax cuts have been, uh, particularly in North Dakota, we've seen them work really, really well. And I, I use the same, the same thing um, to Clark as I would say to my Democratic friends across across the aisle. Is it seems it's like the only time that Democrats will attack something that um, raises the deficit is when we're allowing people of people to keep more of their money. Are you are you acknowledging that the tax cuts raise the deficit? Well, I think in the short term, yeah, they. I, I don't think the tax cuts are the reason the deficit raised that much, but I don't. I mean, they, I, it's going to take a while to work. I mean, not all states are as small as North Dakota, and they don't all work in the same way. Where we have seen the reinvestment in the communities and the reinvestment in businesses, whether it's True North Steel or Gate City Bank. So, but um, I still think it's good policy. I think we tax people too much, and I think we spend too much. Well, I think that's the problem is when you distill something as complex as the federal budget into one variable, obviously there's lots of variables. You know, the other big one, in addition to taxes, raising revenue is obviously spending. And I, I agree with you. So uh, let's keep uh, let's keep moving here from Facebook. Don asks, what is your reaction to Speaker Pelosi while in Europe speaking to NATO, claiming she is co-equal power to President Trump? And also undermining various negotiations. Thank you, Representative Armstrong. I think Speaker Pelosi is um, misinterpreting that Congress is a co-equal branch of government with her her personal and unique power as it compares to the president. And um, I actually said something on Twitter the other day about Joe Biden um, trashing the United States on the foreign stage. And I, I it's it, it, you know, it's. <laughs> It's fairly hypocritical to say we shouldn't trash our, our, our allies in public when we're trashing our own our own people in public. And Nancy Pelosi, in and of herself, does not have equal branch of footing with the president. So, so you're saying I mean, the way she made it sound is I'm Speaker of the House, therefore I'm equal to the president. Your argument is, no, it's not just you, Speaker Pelosi. It's the whole it's the Congress that's co-equal. Yeah. You know, the senate and the house of representatives and the congressional branch in general and yeah i think she's confusing her personal power with the congressional power in general madison and asks, she shouldn't do that 
Madison Rogers asks, thoughts on the 17th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution? Keep, repeal, etc. <laughs> well, I, it, to, to be honest, I don't think a ton about it because I can't imagine a scenario politically where it would ever get repealed. And so you know, the 17th Amendment, for, for, for listeners, the 17th Amendment is uh, regarded uh, the popular election of U.S. senators. And, and the way it was done originally yeah. is, is the senators were essentially appointed by the states. Uh, the 17th Amendment changed that and made them popularly elected. Yeah. And I mean, we could have a discussion of And I think there is real serious discussion about how it's changed, how it's changed things and not all for the better. But I just I honestly I, I don't I don't see any metric where that actually has a likelihood of success. So you think the diet do, do you see that there's something uh, um, a, a difference? I mean, because obviously the House was always intended where you're serving now, the House was always intended to be the more populist legislative body, right? It was originally designed to be popularly elected, whereas the Senate was not. Um, I mean, did, did you see it? Did, did, I, I guess maybe explain, you, you kind of hinted at this. Do you think that popularly electing the Senate has, has hurt us or, or hurt I think our ability is, to govern? Well, no, I, I, I mean, I think there's, I, I mean, I think you can, I mean, there would be some fair criticisms as to um, some of the ways that works, but I, I, I think this is a lot like what you were talking about with tax cuts to, to pick one particular thing and what has changed since that time is I maybe too simplistic a view. Um, we were talking earlier today when I got the news, I got it from either NS, NBC or CBS or the paper when I sat at home. People have more access at this point in time than any time in history, whether it's to your elected officials, a platform to speak out or, I mean, news, information, shopping, all of it. And I don't think society is interested in going back to, I mean, as a whole, going back to a, a more regulated form of that. We got a question from Ron via Facebook. He goes, why did he tweet a tribute to Martin Luther King when he hates democratic socialism? And I think there's been a lot of debate about socialism in our state because there was sort of a, a rash of letters. And then I guess I responded to it. You you retweeted my uh, or tweeted out my, uh, my my article about it. But there's, there's been actually, I, I mean, nationally and in North Dakota, a lot of debate about socialism. Um, and so what, why, why do you oppose, I, I think I know why, but why, why do you oppose socialism so much? Well, because it's failed in every form it's ever existed in the, in the entire history of the world. And it's not about equality. It's more about galvanization of power. Um, and it, it, it just absolutely is a failure as a form of government. And we, we should learn from that. And we've had this conversation, but our, you and I have had it and I've had it with other people. But I mean, to talk about the rise in this, I, I don't think you have to go to very far back. I mean, where it really started again was when Bernie Sanders ran for president in 2016. And if you read the resolution that is the Green New Deal, if that isn't really truly a socialist manifesto, I don't know what is. And it's terrifying to me and it's terrifying to it should be terrifying to anybody who lives in North Dakota. <laughs> do you I, why do you think so many people are suddenly enamored with socialism again? Because I, I think I think you and I look at it and say, I mean, look at this ugly history. Look at the body count of of regimes that have tried to implement socialism. <laughs> why are so many people enamored with it again to the point where we're, we're talking about it? I mean, I mean, you would think that this would be just an unserious thing. But I mean, you mentioned Bernie Sanders. He obviously got a lot of traction nationally. He got a lot of traction in North Dakota when the Democrats held a statewide vote on who they wanted their presidential nominee to be in 2016. Bernie Sanders won in North Dakota. Yeah. And I honestly, I, I mean, I think one of the reasons I, the two things I remember most vividly from my childhood that occurred in a classroom was one, I, I, I remember to this day, the feelings I had in watching the challenger explode. And then the second one was watching, I was in the seventh grade or the eighth grade watching the Berlin wall fall. Um, and then, and I think the farther we get away from those significant and historic events, the, I, I mean, institutional memory is short and it's, it's short amongst the general population as well. And I think the answer is, is, just quite simply, people who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And this is not a road we want to go down. But, I mean, if we want to talk about um, 
a Martin Luther King tweet I, and all of that. I mean, that there was there was something incredibly noble. About, this is also we forget how, how how different the world was not that long ago, and there are a lot of really noble ideas that came from. I mean, Martin Luther King's words alone. I mean, he gave he was one of the best orators you've ever heard, yeah. and there are a lot of things he said that we should all strive to live by every day. I, I suspect that if Martin Luther King was alive today, there'd be a lot of policies that he would support that you and I wouldn't. Uh, just, Absolutely. Just generally. But, uh, you know, I, I, and I, I think maybe this question is such a symptom of today's politics with this idea where you're either on my team or you're not on my team. Conservatives can look at Martin Luther King and obviously find a tremendous amount to admire. Um, understanding that, that even even I mean, the policies, I didn't agree with every policy he supported in his lifetime. If he was still alive today, I wish he was. Uh, I don't think that that I would agree with every policy he would support today. But. I mean, on the big things, boy, we we agreed, and he could articulate them like nobody else. And this idea that you can't like Martin Luther King or you can't praise Martin Luther King unless you subscribe to every one of his ideas is is just. I think that's really what's what's driving a lot of what's wrong today. Hey, courage of conviction is always something to be admired, even when you dis- disagree with the underlying thing. Courage of conviction for a guy who was dealing with issues that you and I could never ever possibly comprehend at an emotional level is something to be admired for sure now i know you're a baseball fan so the last question has to do with baseball uh from uh well dustin monkey you know dustin uh former uh, former editor of the uh dickinson uh dickinson press uh he has thoughts on manny machado signing with the padres uh i think i i <laughs> good for manny machado manny machado is a great player and a great guy um Padre Stadium's a little big. I think his home run numbers are going to go down a little bit. Yeah. But I had actually put a tweet out on my personal page. Um, you know I'm a huge baseball guy, and I think this Saber metrics at post analytics, when you end up in this situation where spring training has started and Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, and Kubel all aren't signed yet, we're getting into a thing that maybe maybe somebody better understand that I, I, I go to a baseball game to watch Justin Verlander come out in the eighth throw gas not some no-name left-handed hey. one-inning relief pitcher who has uh, a better whip after Justin Verlander's seen three times through the lineup. I, I don't mind some of that, but I, the economics, I think, of baseball are kind of broken right now. And I, I say that, I mean, I'm a Yankees fan. I was rooting, I was rooting our, our championship with, with Aaron Judge, John Carlos Stanton, um, you know, uh, our, 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 uh, Miguel Andujar, um, Glaber Torres. I mean, our championship window is open. I was rooting for the Yankees to go full evil empire this off season and just buy oh, buy, sure. buy all the free agents. You know, let's get let's You'll get Harper, see. let's get Machado, and we'll figure out where they're all going to play later. Um, yeah, I mean that's what well, I want to see. And you'll, I, pay the, you'll pay the luxury tax. You're okay with it. Yeah. Well, I honestly, I think George Steinbrenner. I think I think when when he would open up the checkbook, I think that was good for baseball. And uh, I'm not so. I think a lot of people derided it at the time and and whatever, but. I uh, mean, if you want the best talent out on the field, and, and if we want the best talent to play baseball, this this status quo, I think, has got to change. Well, and, I mean, a spending helps, right? I mean, that's, there are a lot of teams that have done well. The Twins have done well in recent history, but I, I, yeah. I mean, but Boston won it last year. The Cubs won it two years or three years ago. I don't think uh, Houston won it the year in between. Uh, I, spending helps. I mean, rebuilding smart baseball helps, but – it, it, this game still stars still matter and uh, it's not all statistic yeah i mean listen even when the yankees weren't winning world series and even though everybody hated him i loved watching alex rodriguez man nobody could play the game like that guy could uh sure, you can argue i mean you can even argue a little bit so that to particularly stats wise Derek jeter may have been overrated until you watch him play in the postseason then he's uh, i mean one of one of I the mean, best ever. one of the best performers you'll ever see in your life and you're not going to see that on a stats no, you're, you're just not. not. No, you're not. Well, Kelly, thanks. I could talk baseball with you all day, but we, uh, I, I Maybe imagine. we'll I do that one day just so we can do ro- <laughs> normal human being congressman for <laughs> yeah, a day. Wouldn't that be nice? We could just, just talk baseball for a while. Yeah, I would enjoy that. So, but I imagine you've got some of the people's business to get to, and uh, we got to wrap this up. Thanks, Rob.
that's it for today's Plane Talk podcast. Remember, new episodes come out Monday through Friday, right away in the morning. Subscribe by going to sayanythingblog.com. Click the Plane Talk podcast link. Uh, all the links you need are there, or just go to the podcast platform of your choice, search for Plain Talk with Rob Port, and you ought to be able to find me. If you ever have any troubles, or you want to get feedback on the show, or you want to send in questions for Congressman Armstrong or Senator Kramer, who have committed to coming on the show every week and, and answering your questions, email all of it to rob at sayanythingblog.com. Follow me on Twitter, at Rob Port. Find me on Facebook. Just search for Rob Port. I'm pretty easy to find. Say Anything blog is on Facebook and Twitter as well. You can follow those accounts. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk again.